Genesis chapter 12. You might even place a marker there. Uh, We're going to be going to a few other passages this morning, but uh, always coming back to this passage and also Genesis uh, 22 as well. Very good to be with you this morning. Uh, Very thankful for this opportunity, always thankful for an opportunity uh, to open up God's Word, to study further from it. Uh, Very thankful for each and every one here, thankful that my parents are here this morning. Glad that you get to meet them. The topic that we're going to be looking at this morning is, I'm sure, not one that's unfamiliar to anyone here, especially the passages that we're going to be turning to in Genesis 12 and Genesis 22. And the topic that I want to present to you is there up on the screen now, uh, and it's presented in the way of the question, does God ask too much of us, or maybe even to Make that more personal for yourself. Does God ask too much of me? Have you ever been asked to do anything in school uh, or on a job that you have said, maybe not out loud, but you've thought it, (laughs) that this is too much for me? This is too much for me to bear. Uh, My boss is asking too much of me. My teacher is asking me uh, to do too much. Maybe even in the home, my parents are asking me to do too much, whatever it might be. You take that a step further, again, have you ever thought to yourself, God, why are you asking this of me? You ask too much. Does God expect much of us? Does God expect much from you? And you can uh, can place this in any given context, whether it be uh, the worship that we offer him, whether it be how we conduct ourselves, Brother Wes has been Uh, very well going through the book of Ephesians. Does it apply to how we are walking? Does God ask too much of us in how we are walking, worthy of that call with which we've been called? Whatever that might look like. If you go over to Genesis chapter 12, you find that uh, God has asked, continues to ask, but uh, has asked through the years hard things of his people. Genesis chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 1, says there, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. We'll stop there for now. First thing to notice here, in verse 1 particularly, Get out of your country. Leave your country. Uh, If you've ever moved out of country for any length of time, or even just moved away from a place that uh, you have lived for quite a a while, you're comfortable there, so now you move off to a new place, you you have found, I'm sure, that that's difficult at first. Uh, Abby and I experienced that more recently in in moving to Virginia, uh, and and then moving here just recently. Uh, And there's a lot of reasons why that might be Uh, difficult, why that might be a hard adjustment at first. You're moving away, first of all, from everything that you are familiar with, and you're moving into a place where you don't know the people. Uh, Maybe if it's a country, you don't even know the language. (laughs) And so there's that there's that extra barrier there. There's there's that extra hurdle that you have to have to overcome. And so you, you look again here at this verse. So we start with get out of your country. Okay, that's difficult but leave your family, leave your relatives. And then you notice there the Lord even breaks that down into a more personal category from your father's house, even more personal. So it's a difficult thing to leave everything you've ever known. It's hard to leave places uh, that we're familiar with, that we're comfortable in. And it's even more dreaded, it's even more difficult to say those dreaded goodbyes to the ones that we love the most, that we cherish the most. And Abram had to endure that. And he did so without knowing where he was going. Most of us, we at least know where we're going to end up. Abram didn't even know where he was going. And so even in this verse, we see God does ask hard things of Abram. And so none of this is easy. I don't, think, I don't think the Lord would present this as being an easy thing, and I don't think Abram saw this as an easy thing. However, this is easy, 
in comparison with what we find over in Genesis chapter 22. So go ahead and turn over there to Genesis 22. Again, sure, not an unfamiliar story there. First thing that I want to notice found there in verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Again, notice here how the Lord uses language. We saw in chapter 12 where uh, it's leave your country, leave your family, leave your father's house. Here in uh, chapter 22, in verse 2, take your son, your only son, and we can read in between the lines there a little bit if we've already uh, read the in-between chapters, the son who I promised uh, a nation will come from, and then whom you love. All of these phrases are stacked on, one on top of the other. I think, it would seem, to emphasize the magnitude of what God is asking of Abraham. So he says, you offer your son, your only son, whom you love, as a burnt offering to me. So we can look at that, and Abraham could have said that, surely this is too much. Surely you are asking too much of me. You've already made this promise to me, that nations are going to come from this son of promise, and now you're asking me to remove him from the picture. Not only did God ask much of Abraham, he does ask much of us as well. Turn over to your New Testaments to Luke chapter 14. And put a marker there in Genesis. Luke chapter 14 Look with me there, beginning in verse 25. Luke 14, verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross... And come after me, cannot be my disciple. Skip down there uh, to verse 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, cannot be my disciple. As it happened many times during Jesus' ministry, he finds himself in the midst of people, great multitudes of people, everyone that you can imagine, from every uh, walk of life, every class of life. And you find here uh, in these verses, this is an address uh, not to his disciples, which he would do on occasion, not, or not exclusively to his disciples, his apostles. It's not exclusively to the Pharisees, but rather this is to everyone. This is to all who are there, all of the multitudes. And so he says, anyone and everyone who comes must, notice the language there, must hate mother and father, wife, husband, brothers and sisters, and there at the very end, even their own life. Now we know from Scripture and other places that we ought not despise or hate anyone, right? We know that. We can go to those Scriptures. So certainly we we ought not to Uh, hate our spouses. We've been going again through Ephesians. That that language is not there uh, in that way. Uh, Maybe in your youth you find it hard uh, to not hate your siblings, right? (laughs) How can I not hate my brother? How can I not hate my sister? But I don't think that's entirely uh, the image what we're getting at here. If you go over to back to Genesis, actually over in Genesis 29, I want to look at uh, how this word is used here. Genesis 29 in verse 30. Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. 
and he served with Laban still another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So you notice there in verse 31, the word unloved there, that word is also translated hated or despised. It might be translated that way in your own Bible. And so some translations will give uh, the, liter the literal meaning of the Hebrew word there, which is hated, and then another, uh, like the one that I'm reading from, the New King James Version, giving the sense of what's being described, the feeling that uh, Leah had uh, because he treated Rachel one way and treated her another way, and that's the feeling of loved less. Literally, that's what that means, loved less. So Jacob loved Leah less than Rachel. I think that's the same point that Jesus is making over there in Luke. When we follow Jesus, it may even look outwardly to other people as though we do hate all of those other relationships because we love Jesus so much and we want to please him and we want to be with him. And so we, when we allow Jesus to enter our hearts and to dwell within us truly for that to happen, he expects us to prioritize him above all others. And so it's going to seem that we love those others less and that we love him more. And that's how it should be. So when, when you become a disciple of Christ, when you are a saint in his kingdom, he is highest on the totem pole. He's up there and it's not even close. Shouldn't be. I love my parents, I love my family. And I always will. But <clears throat> that's not going to take any priority as compared to Abby. Abby is always going to be the, the highest relationship that I prioritize in this life. All of my energies, all of my efforts, all of my time, she comes first. However, if your spouse, if your family, if anything else is first in your life before Christ, before God, you still have something lacking. We've been seeing that in the study of the divided kingdom uh, in, in our classes. Marcus has been leading us through that. They did not prioritize God above all else. And so judgment came. And that, that really is something that we as humans struggle with. We struggle with it so much. It's not a new problem. Of course, the people that we spend the most time with, they are going to be the ones that we uh, enjoy company with, that we love, um, and that we are kind of in that comfort zone. But how much time, how much energy, how much devotion do you show to Christ? Yes, we are here on the first day of the week, as it should be, to give God that priority, to give him that honor. What about the other days? What are you dedicating to him? Again, <clears throat> referencing again over there in Luke, we must also hate our own lives. And this is the biggie. We must forsake, Christ says there, all that we have. Maybe another way of saying this, look out not for your own interests, but for the interests of Christ to turn that phrase a little bit. And he says there in verse 31, you need to put self aside, put pride aside. That's really the sense of what's being talked about there, to take up your cross and to follow after him. Put that away. And so these words are striking. They are difficult. They're especially difficult to put into practice. But that doesn't make them any less true. And so <clears throat> when you read this passage, you might be like, uh, Daniel, towards the end of Daniel there, where Daniel says it, it troubled Daniel in his heart, uh, these words that God had given to him. How can I understand this? How can I use this? How can I implement this? There are some passages, like in Daniel, that are, that are hard um, from the standpoint of interpretation. How do I interpret this? How, how do I get the sense of what God is actually talking about here? Well, in Luke, and with Abraham in both instances, in chapter 12 of Genesis and chapter 22, God's pretty 
And, and Jesus is pretty point blank. <laughs> There's not really any wiggle room there. He lays it out. That's how it is. How do we put it into practice? So these are the hard things. God does ask hard things of us. I don't think uh, we can deny that. I don't think we should deny that. However, God asks nothing of us that he is not willing to do himself. God says, again, over there in Genesis chapter 12, leave your country, leave your family, leave your father's house, and go to this land that I will show you, that you don't know yet, but this is where I'm going to lead you. So it's a hard thing. This is hard. What did Jesus give up? You go over there to Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, you talk about leaving a place of comfort. <laughs> Let's look at what Jesus had to leave for us. Philippians chapter 2, uh, beginning there in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. Jesus was in heaven in need of nothing. He himself in need of nothing. And yet, he did not use the situation that he was in, being at the right hand of God, to say, I will not serve, I will not go, I will not love. Made no excuses. He said, this is, this is the purpose for which I have come. And he said that many times during his ministry. And not only, again, we know this, not only did he leave heaven, but he, of course, as we have observed this morning, died that horrible death. And it amazes me, you go throughout all of the Gospels, not only did he do that, but he knew the whole time what it was leading up to. He knew the whole time where he was going. You see there in, uh, in the book of Luke, uh, Brother Holly emphasizes this when he's uh, going through the study of Luke. He's always setting his face towards Jerusalem because he knows that's where he's going. He did so willingly. And he did so, again, not for anything that he needed, but for what we needed. And he offered that willingly. You go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. You don't have to turn over there, but it says there that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. For our sakes he became poor. That you, through his poverty, bringing himself low, might become rich. That's beautiful. And Christ did that for you. He did that for me. Another passage in the Gospels, Jesus says there himself, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This wasn't anything about his exaltation. He was always, he was always giving glory and honor and exaltation to the Father. And then through that, the Father exalted him. <clears throat> Coming back to Genesis... You go back to Genesis chapter 22, I want to observe some other things there. Uh, and then really bring these things forward to Christ. Genesis 22, you notice there uh, in verse 3, Abraham rose early. Though this was a difficult thing, and God asked much of Abraham, Abraham didn't wait around to do this thing. He didn't wait around for the next day. He didn't say, oh, I'll give it a week, I'll think on this God, and I'll, then I'll make a decision. Seems it was pretty, pretty much immediately uh, after he had gotten this message. He rose early in the morning. And so his obedience was not without conviction. 
And part of the reason of his promptness here is because the character of God had already proven faithful to Abraham time and time and time again. So Abraham said, oh, all right, you've led me this far, you've blessed me this much, I trust you, I'll go and do this. Notice also in verse 4, uh, this was a prolonged obedience. This really impresses me. Verse 4 then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Abraham, with his son Isaac, has been hiking cross country for three days. Any of you who've ever been hiking before, uh, you know that's really some of the best time uh, that you can have to think on things, to think on things deeply, um, and to really just put everything else aside and think about that. That is not entirely the situation that Abraham is going through here. Yes, he had time to think, and he had three days to think about, again, as Jesus did, I'm, I'm going to the mountain, and I'm going to do this thing. And not once, at least from the passage here, do we see any doubt there. Do we see any, uh, any hint of him turning around and going back from where he had come? He kept going. And he was steadfast in his conviction. Verse 5, Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And notice here, And we will, we will come back to you. Hebrews chapter 11 gives us a little more insight uh, into that language. Because it, it says there that Abraham reasoned that God could even raise him from the dead, could raise his son Isaac from the dead. Because again, what had God promised? That Isaac was the son of promise, through whom these nations would come, or this nation would come. And so Abraham has that conviction leading up right into verses 10 through 14 here. I'll start, I'll start in verse 10 here. Uh, Abraham stretched out his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham calls, uh, or called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Could you take your child, your only child, and offer them up? as a sacrifice to, to God. And not only that, again, you've been told that this child is one who will bring about a nation, many good things will come of this, and now you're being asked to sacrifice them. We see a lot of similarities in terms of hard things that are asked of Abraham in Genesis 12, Genesis 22. But I think we can make even more profound similarities and connections between this chapter, Genesis 22, and the cross. Again, take your son, your only son, whom you love. How many times throughout the Gospels is Jesus referred to in that way? Many times, right? You take your son, the Lord says to Abraham, and you offer him on a mountain, where was Christ crucified? On Mount Calvary. You go again to Genesis 22, backing up there to verses uh, 6 and 9. And you look at the word that's used there, the Hebrew word for wood. Just a simple word, right? <clears throat> that word is most often translated, and again, it might be translated that way in your own Bible, as tree. Deuteronomy 21 Verses 22 uh, and 23 says there, Cursed is the one who hangs on the tree. 
Christ took on the consequences and experienced that curse for us. We who should have experienced that. All of these things should remind us of the cross. We will find that what God did through Jesus is even greater than what God asked of Abraham. So much greater. So much greater than we can ever imagine. When God saw the faith of Abraham demonstrated by his willingness to raise the knife as it was coming down, the Lord says, I know. I know that you have the faith, Abraham. And so he stopped that knife from falling on Isaac, the son of promise, and the rest is history, as they say. That execution was stopped by God. But when it came to the sacrifice of Jesus, God did not stop the hands of the ones who were going to sacrifice his only son. He let the execution be had. And so it was the will of the Father that this, that this son should die. And God did that not for any flippant reason, not for any meaningless reason, but he did so in order that sinners like you and sinners like me might have that fellowship and be sons, that is, be those that inherit that great inheritance, and we share in that inheritance with Christ. So many times uh, when we observe the Lord's Supper, we'll go to so many passages. Isaiah 52, the, the latter end of 52 leading into 53, is a, a common one that we will use, and rightly so, that great prophecy pointing to Christ. He was despised. He was rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with, so very familiar with grief. I'm sure that we've all, all encountered uh, this phrase from time to time. Maybe you've said it yourself. I've read the Bible, and it's clear to me that God wants me to be happy. It's clear to me that God wants uh, the best for me in a very superficial, uh, kind of shallow type of way. They say that. And so he would never want anything bad to happen to me. Isn't it a shame that Jesus never had to experience or got to experience that type of happiness? He must have never experienced joy or happiness if that's what we're defining as joy and happiness. Because he was rejected, despised, sorrowful, again, acquainted or familiar with grief. So he bore our griefs, our griefs. He carried our sorrows, and we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. I don't think any of us can even come close to using more eloquent words than those words. And yet, I don't even think those words cover it, what Christ did for us, what he continues to do for us, the blessings that we have in Christ. And so whenever you find yourself, whenever you find yourself having doubts, whenever you find yourself uh, broken, keep coming back to the cross. Always come back to the cross. This is, the, this is part of, and really, uh, the perfect declaration of God, of who God is. John chapter 1 tells us that. He is the perfect declaration of God. He's God in the flesh. So if you're unsure uh, of whether or not you can believe this, whether or not you can carry on, come back to the cross. Come back to Christ. Look at what, ha look at what he had to endure. The Lord certainly asks those hard things of us, those who are his people. But he himself has demonstrated each of those even through his own son. Final point this morning. God's promises of blessing are greater, so much greater, than his demands for us. 
While God asks much of Abraham, he promises so much more to him. We'll finish up that reading going back to Genesis chapter 12. Looking at verses 2 and 3 again, I'm sure not an unfamiliar passage to us. This is the more familiar portion of this. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. You go down there to verse 7. Then the Lord uh, appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Throughout the Old Testament, we've seen this again uh, in, our, uh, in our classes, we see judgments being made against those nations that would dare to persecute and to come against God's people and God himself, whether that be uh, Philistia, Edom, Moab, even God's own people, right, Israel and Judah. And much of that judgment is being done upon the promise given to Abraham here in chapter 12 of cursing and blessing, well before Deuteronomy. We find that here. All of the families of the earth. That points directly to the opening of the book of Acts, where we see that great multitude that's gathered there and the church begins. And those blessings continue today. Those who are in Christ, we are a part of that promise, a part of that blessing that was promised to Abraham all those many years ago. Are you willing to start down that road? That road of leaving all that you know in the world to walk with Christ. And many times even to walk not knowing what may happen to you. Not knowing uh, what suffering might come, what persecution might come. And it may even be a lonely road at times because, again, going back to Luke, some of those family ties may be cast off because some don't want anything to do with that. And they certainly don't want anything to do with you if you choose that path. But God's promises always always outweigh the hardships. I have several passages listed up there on the screen. Don't worry, we're not going to turn to all of those. I encourage you to look at all of those, but we're just going to turn to one passage over in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 in verse 28. Mark 10, beginning in verse 28. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last first whatever you leave to follow after Christ you will be blessed beyond that Jesus mentioned some things. Yes, there are some things you will be blessed with in this life. But, he says there towards the very end, it's not always going to be sunflowers and daisies and rainbows and unicorns. It's with persecutions. But then he ends it, the very end, by saying, it all ends with eternity. And not just eternity, not just... Not just a length of time, but quality time. Quality of length and time, because it's with the Father. This is not just a dwelling place without tears, without sorrows, without pains. So many, so many times we emphasize that part of it, and that's certainly there. But all of those things aren't there because God is there. And so that's why... The tears aren't there. The pain isn't there. That death isn't there. 
we have announcements at every service, those that are sick, those that are in the hospital, uh, those who have just recently passed away. We're not going to have announcements in eternity. <laughs> but rather, we are going to have declarations of praise and honor and glory to the Father because that's where He is. And we finally get to see Him. That's what we're working towards, no matter what this life might throw at us. And so we see there that this eternal life refers not to a, qu not to a uh, quantity of life, but a deep and meaningful quality of life. It will be what life was always intended to be, what was lost in the garden, and that is perfect fellowship with God. It will be living, and it will be living in His presence. That's why it's worth living now, because we get to be with Him for eternity. Do you think those that lived in the first century and even many years after that, do you think that those who gave their life for Christ thought God asked too much of them? Certainly they thought it was hard. Do you think they asked or they thought that God asked too much of them? Jesus himself said many times, the apostles said this as well, that they would suffer. They would go through such persecutions. You go there uh, to the book of Revelation, and it's laid out there for John uh, what was to be expected for God's people for a time during that, that persecution. But they found that it was well worth their time to endure that. And yes, some even died in Christ, were brutally murdered and killed for the cause of Christ. And why? Because they had something else to look forward to. A quality of life. Again, you go to many um, historical texts, secular texts. You can go to the first century, the second century, even bleeding into the third and fourth centuries. You look at all the Roman emperors that had all these persecutions against God's people. I ran across this um, recently. This is a quote from uh, Eusebius uh, in his popular uh, text on the church history. And this took place during uh, the third, really bleeding into the fourth century there. Uh, and I'll just read that quote here. Under the aforementioned rulers, he mentions there uh, previously Diocletian and uh, Galerius, who would have, uh, they, they did reign during the third and fourth centuries there. But continuing, a certain man was brought into a public place in order to sacrifice. And the context there infers that this is sacrifices made to the emperors because uh, many times during that time, the gods were considered, or, or the emperors were considered to be gods. When he refused, he was hoisted up naked and lashed with many whips until he should give in. Since even this failed to bend him, they mixed salt with vinegar and poured it over the lacerations of his body, where the bones were already protruding. When he scorned these agonies too, a lit brazier was applied, and the rest of his body was roasted by the fire, as if meat for eating. Not all at once, lest he find too quick a release little by little. Still he clung immovably to his purpose and expired triumphantly in the middle of his tortures. Such was the martyrdom of one of the imperial servants that's <clears throat> referred to there as one of the soldiers in the court there, who was truly worthy of his name, Peter. May God help us to reach the end, to endure till the end, and to have such faith and conviction as men like these who have come before us, faith of our fathers living still. May we keep that in our hearts. As the promise was given to Abraham, this blessing is to all nations, it's to all peoples, 
God offers that salvation. And he offers it and can only offer it because of his son. God asks much of you. He doesn't ask too much of you. Maybe you've violated his will. <clears throat> Maybe you've gone beyond what you ought. The sacrifice is still there. It covers all sins, no matter how egregious. And that mercy and that cleansing and that holiness can still be achieved because of Christ. And if you believe that, then you can have that perfect fellowship with him now, and that will go on into eternity. What a wonderful image. May that be said of all of us here this morning. If you have a need this morning, if you have not put on Christ, if you wish to put on Christ, please do that this morning, or make those necessary corrections if need be. And let us all take these Take these things to heart. Hopefully take these into the next week and live as we are. If you have any need this morning, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?